I was just thrilled to to um, get. Uh, sorry, I'm just hitting OK for the record. Um, I was just really surprised and really thrilled. I was awarded the NEA 2023 Heritage Fellowship Award um, in traditional arts. Um, so I am, as you know, or as you're about to learn, I'm a traditional artist of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hadaquina. And um, I work primarily in shell carving, wampum making, and I'm also a textile artist and natural dye artist. I do practice other art forms as well because I try to be pretty well-rounded, come from a creative family, and um, have a strong kind of streak of self-reliance as well. So I like all of our different traditional life ways as much as I can work. So that was that was my good good news at the beginning of the year. Great. And what does NEA stand for for those who oh. don't know? National Endowment for the Arts. Well, that's very exciting. Yeah. Uh, so wonderful. So thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge and passion um, for not only um, traditional arts, but the natural world as well. I know it's something that you're very passionate about. So thank you. Um, for those of you, we are recording this video. So be sure to um, share. It'll be up on our YouTube channel for Pinewoods Dance Camp. Um, usually it gets, um, we'll have it up within a week or so um, and share that. And I do want to say thank you so much to the um, Mass Cultural Councils and the Situate and Plymouth Cultural Councils um, for their support of um, this program. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, She'll go through her um, slide presentation and then we'll do some Q&A uh, towards the end. Um, so go ahead. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Katavatash. Um, thank you, Chris. Wanikisak, uh, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you all um, and to share a little bit about my, I always do that advance without intending to, uh, show my PowerPoint about traditional arts. I'm going to talk both about my own art practice and some of my research, some of, some of my mapping projects. Um, I do a lot of historical research based primarily in the Northeast, sometimes expanding out into the Great Lakes and Canadian areas as well. Um, some of that is just my own passion. Some of it is because museums hire me to do that kind of work or digitization uh, work as well. Um, and then, of course, some of those old collections that are quite beautiful of Eastern art um, also invariably influences my practice. Um, sometimes the inspiration for our arts in Native communities come from our homelands themselves, you know, the, the rich plays in our communities, um, the beautiful woods, the beautiful shells, like the Quahog shell that we use with our, in our wampum. Um, those are all things that we interact with on a daily basis and see and appreciate and have generations of, you know, association with that go back a long time in our families and are, you know, really richly described in, within our own Indigenous languages as well. Um, and so as a result, some of our words that we use in sort of modern English, if you will, nowadays come out of my language, which is Wampanoag and other Eastern seaboard languages, whether it's Powhatan or um, some of the Seminole tribes or some of the Canadian tribal nations as well. Um, you can see how our words were brought into the English language because it was a new place for the folks coming here and they didn't you know, have wampum back home. And so they started to use our words for it and interact with tribal people. So needing to use our words and our place names mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so these are some <laughs> pictures from our um, tribal homelands. This is Aquina uh, down at the bottom with the colorful clay cliffs. This is taken in pretty bright sunlight. So you don't get as many of the colors as you could, but you can see some black and yellow and white. There's actually richer red than you see here in this picture, depending on where you are along the cliffs. And I'm on top at the overlook looking out and it's also a beautiful place. If you wanna watch seals sometimes and birds, um, you can also, if you're lucky that day, sight some whales. Um, out in the ocean, you can look towards the Elizabeth Islands and appreciate those. So it's really a lovely spot. And then um, where I reside on the mainland, I'm looking sort of the other direction. So I'm looking through the Elizabeth Islands to Martha's Vineyard and on a clear day, you can just kind of see the cliffs. Um, if you look in the right spot, just beyond the smaller Elizabeth Islands. So the upper corner uh, picture is actually a beach here uh, in the South Coast Mass area looking out towards the Elizabeth Islands and, and towards Martha's Vineyard or Nope, as we call it in my language. Um, 
so a big part of my practice is to make um, traditionally inspired jewelry. I work a lot in wampum. I'm actually wearing, which you probably can't see, I'm wearing um, soapstone earrings that I carved that are pretty three-dimensional. Uh, it's another traditional material and kind of a green or gray or black, um, also used for traditional pipes and bowls and things like that. I don't do that kind of work. My brother is a wonderful pipe carver um, and he works with copper as well. Um, so yeah, I like to know about the other materials even that I don't use. This is my work um, using primarily the shell. You can see the rich purple color from the quahog. Each one is distinct and different, which lends a different look to the jewelry. Some of it's quite bluish, like this um, killer whale. I'm known for my marine mammal designs. And they're pretty thick and pretty sculptural. I'm wearing a killer whale today. I think the light could be better in my kitchen, sorry. Um, on some deer skin that I dyed uh, with some wampum beads as well. Sometimes I use antlers, sometimes I use bones, sometimes I use glass trade beads. And I actually worked um, recently on a documentary film that focuses both on wampum bead making and on glass bead making because I use those red uh, white heart beads in my art. And I decided to partner with a European artist and we documented the glass bead production in the Czech Republic. And she, she came and we documented some of my bead making and we had a nice time. Material culture studies obviously are, I like geeking out on that kind of thing. Um, and I never get bored from it. So it's just part of my practice. These are more examples of some of my work. So there's um, really historically inspired um, wampum leadership medallion in the top. There's a wampum belt on traditional milkweed fiber that I spun and dyed myself. Um, I use a lot of natural dyes. They're non-toxic, they're local, they're sustainable. And I had to work really hard over years to really redraw, basically revive those traditions, I should say, I guess, because um, the commercial dyes have really supplanted some of those practices. It's also harder to do, it's more tricky because you have to grow your own plants because they're not necessarily super common in the environment here in Massachusetts anymore, in Eastern Rhode Island, because a lot has changed, the soil has changed and there are a lot of um, introduced plants that have taken the place of our some of our plants. What I do in addition to making pieces for native people's use and non-native customers, I also work with um, wardrobe and theater. Um, so there was a play called Manhattan, um, and there were three different productions. The first was in New York, second was in um, Oregon, and Oregon Shakespeare Theater put it on. And then um, the most recent one was just, just before the pandemic at Yale Repertory Theater. Um, which was really nice. And I, you can see there's a gentleman in the upper, um, my upper right hand corner and he's wearing a glass wampum cuff with a Thunderbird design that I had made a set of. I made a glass wampum belt and there was a bias collar of real wampum similar to the one that I've shown down in the bottom center with the hand medallion. Those are another traditional form of wampum um, going way back, they probably get less attention, I feel like academically and in museum exhibits, than the classic straight vertical or horizontal wampum belts um, for trade and wear and history keeping and things like that. I like them, they have um, a certain kind of elegant drape and a feminine quality, I think that really appeals to me. Um, and then uh, I've worked on exhibits uh, with other tribes. so. At the library company, they were um, working with tribal nations from that area and their descendants that have, some of which have moved, um, it, you know, much further west into places like Canada and Oklahoma. Um, and it was dealing with some rough history. The artist who uh, produced this graphic comic dealing with those times um, was really fascinated by wampum and wampum culture to the degree that the museum actually reached out to me and asked, well, you know, we have all these illustrations. We'd love to have an actual piece of wampum for folks to see as well. And so they commissioned me to create a modest wampum belt for that exhibit. And again, I think timing was lucky in many ways because it was just before the pandemic in 2019. Um, so I was a little bit more content. I think when I finally did get stuck in the house in 2020, I had run all around and had fun um, and met a lot of different people. Um, and so it made it a little bit easier to bear, I think that subsequent isolation um, as well. So in addition to my wampum practice, and I should say there are a lot of native people in the Northeast who work with wampum now, it's really um, had a resurgence and it's really, really, really nice to see as well. Um, it's nice that the general public has more of an appreciation. It's quite uh, a bit more 
supportive, I think, of Northeastern Native arts and identity. Um, and it's been, you know, a long time in coming, and I'm really glad to see that today. Um, so in addition to, uh, you know, my artistic practice, um, I also am fascinated by old maps and um, placemaking and Native identity. And so I've worked on my own projects. I've created a map using just Native place names that was fairly spare and still a fairly conventional looking map. Um, in the early 2000s, I was working on a King Phillips War documentary project, doing tons of research and, you know, that fed into my map making, making as well. The upper right map is an authentic one from the 17th century, end of the 17th century when Martha's Vineyard was going from being basically um, part of New York colony to Mass Bay colony. Um, and so prior to that, and even afterwards, we were dealing a lot with the Dutch um, in New York and um, there were court you know, cases and things like that. Um, there was a lot of trade and interactions, Dutch, French, English, all came to Martha's Vineyard. So you could be trading with, with any of those nations and as well as other European nations. And sometimes things didn't go so well. So, you know, there was a raid on Gay Head um, in the late 17th century. And um, I, I think that uh, the actual identity of the raiders could have been French, could have been Dutch. I'm trying to remember uh, who, who the offending party was, uh, but there was an attack and I think they enslaved um, you know, somewhere along the lines of 15 to 18 um, Native people from my community. And then after that, Aquina became a lot more defense-minded um, and there was a palisade and all of that good stuff after that. Um, I also uh, worked a little bit on my brother's project at Harvard, um, basically hundreds of years after some early Wampanoag graduates of the Harvard Indian School had um, the anniversary had come up and the tribes were really, really um, wanting to see Harvard recognize that and award those degrees posthumously um, because one young man died just shy of graduation um, and the other young man died shortly thereafter. Um, they, you know, there were tough conditions and then there were also, of course, as you know, a lot of pathogens around back then, um, native as well as non-native people would succumb sometimes to smallpox and various other pretty virulent things. Um, and so, you know, that was just something people had to contend with back then. So these particular young men, unfortunately did not live to come back um, with that knowledge to our communities, but, you know, other tribal folks in the region, of course, went to Harvard um, at various times throughout its history. So this was, in some ways, the We Too project was commemorating some of that. Um, the fact that Cambridge is obviously native space and um, you know, it was an interesting project. I really don't know when the last time there was a We Too on that land or near that, that place. Um, it's really interesting to think about. Um, there's a really beautiful hawk that visited us. We were putting up the We Too and it looked amazing. You know, there's pretty good sized trees in Harvard Yard. And from a distance, it really looked pretty incredible. And I know the native students there um, enjoyed learning to work on the We Too and just look out the window and experience it and see it. It just lasted a month. Um, and then we had to take it down, unfortunately, but it would have been amazing as a permanent, I think, addition to Harvard Yard. It would have been um, really healing, I think, for the place and very acknowledging of, of native presence. Um, my fascination with maps continued. I have a new series of bear maps with a lot more place names. Um, you know, I'm, my work is ongoing, trying to recapture the names. Sometimes I will put um, a little bit more of an accurate native name where it's been mispronounced um, and misspelled and truncated by, you know, English folks. It's been anglicized essentially. Um, and then sometimes I don't mess with it simply because it's still used today and it's recognizable. And if I revert back to the original one, this, you know, it's not going to be as recognizable. So I kind of usually just try to explain that when I'm presenting the maps and they're on exhibit. I have one at Fruitlands Museum. Uh, there was one that um, Boston University commissioned where it was a bear that was fishing um, for trout. Uh, in the springtime, so he's lean, um, that I had a nice time working on, and then I'm working on another one for uh, the Mead Museum as well, so that's going to be my most recent installation in that series. It's been fun. So they're big watercolor paintings 
um, and the, the text is very, you know, hand-drawn. Um, so it doesn't look like a conventional map with city names and highways. Um, the, the ways that I put on it um, so far, I've mainly been focusing on rivers, but I think I'll have some pathways and some uh, where I can discern those, especially ones that are more um, focused on one particular area where I can get down to that detail um, in my map. I also do educational posters um, using my art, doing creative photography of those art pieces together. Bentley University started to have a Native American day um, when I think Tessa Tosa Tuhart uh, was there some years back and um, we had a really nice time of it. Um, and so they commissioned me to create something to commemorate that, a piece of artwork. So I created this poster with, with art and talking about Wampanoag survivance and worldview and um, how saying we're doing things and preserving things and um, teaching for the next generation's benefits for the next seven generations. It's not just poetic, it sounds poetic, but it really was, it, excuse me, I apparently need more coffee. It really is with the, um, the aim of genuinely benefiting those next generations. If we think of the land as not something that we exclusively own, you know, my property is my property. And then when I go, who cares? If I think of it more so that I'm holding it for the next seven generations, it's not mine, it's really my grandkids or my grandnieces and nephews. It changes how I take care of those resources, what I use up, what I choose to plant now so it will mature for those next generations to have and enjoy. Um, and also the next generations of the other beings in this area, like the birds and the animals. Um, yeah, it just, uh, it's a little bit, richer um, than it sounds on the surface. Um, I do quite a bit of collections research, as I mentioned, and I do it all over the place. And sometimes I do it remotely. So during the pandemic, uh, the Co Foundation contacted me. I had visited them in person when I was in New Mexico for uh, Santa Fe Indian Market. I had some time beforehand, gotten into their collection a little bit, but they asked me to give a talk. And I said, well, you know, can you send me some pictures of Wampanoag art that you have or Eastern art? And I said, oh, we don't, I don't think we have any Wampanoag art. They did, it was misspelled. Um, so I found it in the, uh, the list of baskets they sent me. And um, it was really nice because these are uh, Aquina baskets. They're from Martha's Vineyard from my tribal community. They're 19th century. Um, there's, I think, initials on the bottom of the basket. So it's kind of tantalizing. You know, I was trying to figure out who some of the possible people were who made these baskets. They're very distinctive. So Wampanoag people, made splint basketry when it was you know commonly used traditional part of our material culture and there were more trees obviously all over the place um, so we liked hickory for our splint basketry it's, it's pretty serviceable it's durable and rather than strictly painting or swabbing a basket with color um, people like to do uh, imprinted designs pokered designs so it's textured and pushed in or burnt into the basket and it gives it this kind of interesting, distinctive, and rather, I think, old fashioned um, look. Um, and so it's, it's sort of an art that I consider more related to wood carving and um, you know, the, in, the engraved copper work that my brother does or carving of ivory and bone um, in traditional native ways or even powder horns in the 18th century and that sort of thing, 17th century. Um, sort of more textured, a little bit more attention is paid to it, and I really like them. So it's a, it's a nice, it's a rare find, but it's a really nice find when I do encounter them. And I'd like, I would like to uh, incorporate some of this into my work, um, probably more in two-dimensional pieces um, rather than basketry, but we'll see how, how that goes. Um, I also do a lot of twine weaving, so there's a lot of different weaves in native um, textiles as well as basketry and matting. Um, sometimes the technique varies with material. So you might sew a cattail mat. You know, if you've got access to a lot of the long reeds, we had tons of swamps, you know, going, going back before all of the development in Massachusetts, it'd be tons and tons and tons of cattail swamps and bulrush um, growing in wetlands as well. And so those both are gorgeous materials for large mats that you can use for, you know, drying mat, drying food, drying supplies. Um, creating shade arbors. You can line the inside of your house for decoration and for warmth. Um, they're very useful things and they last for years. You know, they're tightly woven, the, the materials are good. Um, and so it's a lovely material. Um, corn husk, of course, is 
something that's completely sustainable. You just grow, grow the corn and you dry the husk and then um, you can dye it. Uh, it's very, it's pretty thick. Um, so you can create, I'm losing my earpiece here. You can create um, basketry, matting. I've actually even seen corn husk shoes. I, I don't know if I'd wear them because I can't imagine that they wouldn't be loud, but I could be wrong. Um, but it makes sense that they would last, um, you know, and plant materials like flag and corn husk were used for sandal making and things like that as well. Um, soft fiber basketry has a similar appearance, but of course it's soft, softer and very much more um, pleasant to the touch, I think in some ways. Um, traditional materials would include milkweed fiber, um, basswood fiber, sort of intermediate. So that's like basswood inner bark, um, poplar inner bark is great for weaving, twine weaving and other types of weaves as well. Um, milkweed, dogbane, false nettle, uh, butterfly weed. Not all of those plants are common now because when people have fields that they want to, you know, mow and hay for various domestic animals, milkweeds are actually toxic to domestic animals. Wild animals will know to avoid them, um, not so much domestic animals. So folks for a long time have been pulling those out of their fields and eradicating them. And it just means that they aren't everywhere. And it's a loss, not only I think for traditional artists, but it's also a loss for pollinator species. You know, um, hummingbird moths love um, not only bee bin, not only bee bomb, excuse me, but also um, Indian hemp is one of their favorites. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's reasons why those plants should be pretty common in our homelands even today. I try to plant them um, and I encourage other folks to, and I've done some garden installations in various places, including the colleges I work at. Um, so, you know, I like to, to hope that that is contributing to some of the improved health, I think of the environment in New England. So in addition to that work, I do a lot of consulting at museums that want to update their exhibits. There's been, you know, I think over the years, uh, growing awareness that there are out of date museum exhibits on Native Americans, um, they, you know, might have a lot of bias uh, because many of them were designed and, you know, set up, created by non-Native people for a non-Native audience with, with a lot of bias, with a lot of stereotypical ideas, um, without understanding the technology behind the, the pieces that they have acquired or you know, found in archeological sites and things like that. So there isn't the cultural context in many cases. Other times it's labeled as native objects, but it's actually where various folks at museums, including archeologists um, were experimenting with trying to make native looking things. Um, so their reproductions didn't ever get touched by native people, but yet they've managed to get labeled as native. And so it's complicated when I go in and I say, well, who made this? Well, we're not sure. Okay, so you know, you do some research and you realize it's it's a former employee who's not native in any way, shape, or form. And I said, well, if you want to call it a native exhibit, technically that shouldn't be there. You could have an exhibit of things be people made to look native <laughs> and label it that. That's okay, but you know, don't cheat your public and misrepresent things um, because there's a lot of good material out there. There's contemporary artists you can work with, and so I just I like the transparency and um, authenticity. I think it's really important. I worked with the Concord Museum on their Musketaquid exhibit um, some years ago, probably well, probably a good five years ago now. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think having a range of materials from the Northeast, porcupine quill work, both historical as well as contemporary. I do a lot of naturally dyed porcupine quill cuffs um, and chokers and headbands, and I'd like to work on a belt soon as well. So those are traditional things. Uh, when there was more forest, more animals, more resources, more time uh, before industrialization and colonization and all the fun stuff that we experienced, um, there was a lot of rich material culture. You know, so traditional clothing would be oftentimes deerskin and other types of leathers or hand woven. Um, the, the deer skins would be hand painted really fine. So this, this bag in the lower corner here, this is all hand painted deer skin. I'm using high quality modern acrylic paints. Um, my ancestors would be hand processing their own pigments and then things like red ochre and various other pigments in this region. 
um, that you would grind up. Uh, you know, if you're making a paint, then you it's quite simple. You just harvest wild bird eggs, like maybe get some turkey eggs for a lot of material. You take that egg white and that's your basis for your paint and you put your pigments in there and then you have your, your stylus carved to bone or antler or wooden tools that you're doing your actual painting, pushing it into the leather, not lightly on the surface because it would just flake off and it wouldn't last through wear and through careful washings and things like that. Um, and you can reapply if it gets a little bit worn with use. You can always repaint, strengthen the lines, darken lines, add a little bit of color as well. Um, so it's, you know, your clothing, just like anything else, is something that you maintain. And the nicest th stuff, it goes without saying, that's for special occasions. So you wouldn't wear it every day or, you know, the folks making your clothes would just cry. <laughs> um, these are other, you know, I've done residencies of various kinds um, in multiple places, including now the Netherlands as well. Um, and I, pre pre uh, I have presented in many different colleges across the country. I've run workshops, done demonstrations. I'm very interested in maritime traditions um, and arts. And that's a photo of me working on an eel trap. I like um, fishing technology. I love, you know, net making, spinning rope. Um, making fishing line, that sort of thing. This was an ash and cedar bark trap. And I did not have a teacher to teach, you know, folks aren't making their fish traps now, as you might imagine, um, generations ago, you know, early 19th century, uh, no, sorry, early 20th century, yes. Um, up until then, of course. Um, grapevine was used, cedar was used, um, ash was used, uh, willow. It's another great material to, to tightly twine a fish trap with and have it last in, in waters, fresh water and um, salt water here with lines and, and floats and things as well. Um, and then you bait them and you just come back to them. Um, because no one's still doing it, I had to go to museum collections. There are a few nice ones um, in New England and really closely examine them, take a million pictures, take a million notes, and then, um, you know, basically you just have to go out and take risks and see if you can reproduce the technology and make something that actually works. Um, and so it was a really interesting experience for me. I love making them. I've done several. There's one I um, donated to the Aquinnah Cultural Center after I fall, um, demonstrated willow um, branch eel trap making. Um, and so, yeah, it's something that continues to interest me. I also do research on, you know, not as ancient things. Um, and so there's some old photography. This was an old daguerreotype that was on eBay and I became fascinated with it. It was of course labeled as a Wampanoag whaleman. And uh, I was a little suspicious because a lot of things are labeled that way. And it usually justifies a really high price being asked because you know there's a big whaling implement craze around here in New England. Um, but I, I had an interesting time researching the who I think the sitter is, is a member of the Boston family on Nantucket. So authentically Wampanoag, uh, a biracial person. So um, Wampanoag as well as African-American. His father was Captain Absalom Boston. Um, so really influential family, very active abolitionists, um, worked to desegregate schools in Nantucket, uh, did a lot of other things on the mainland as well. Um, and this person was really well-traveled and was pretty well covered in newspapers. So I was able to do some research and writing in his particular case, um, which I shared in Dawnland Voices, the publication, the second one, Dawnland Voices 2.0. Um, and the research is actually ongoing. Some material culture projects I've worked on. The top is um, a sash in the Peabody Harvard Museum's collection uh, that I became really fascinated with and was able to convince curators to work with me on discerning some of the materials. And we did archival research as well to try to find where it could have been exhibited. Um, it had come to Peabody Harvard from the American Antiquarian Society. Um, and so it was one of their um, early pieces that was donated by a family that wanted their family's things, you know, to be preserved there in the 19th century. Um, it's a really interesting piece. It's labeled as King Phillips from the um, particular characteristics of the wool and the patterning. Uh, we more so concluded early 18th century date for it. Um, 
you know, circa probably 1710 or so. Um, and it's an interesting combo of trade cloth that's wool, uh, that's probably dyed in England, um, and resist dye, and then also applique of handwoven blue tape that might very well be native made of wool. And then there's a lot of glass beads that are stitched down with Indian hemp. So that's that indigenous sewing thread, weaving material, um, rope material that I mentioned before. Um, and the way that they're sewn down is kind of characteristic of, of traditional beadwork where the person isn't stitching down through all the layers all the way completely through, but they're, they're catching and going through without piercing all the way. And it means the stitching doesn't wear out quite as quickly because it's not rubbing against your body. Um, and so those beads and the other materials that you apply will last a lot longer and they won't be puckering as well. So beading artists even today that are native use that technique when they're sewing down beads, even on deer skin. You know, if it's good deer skin and there's a nice nap, you can have a nice smooth surface without a bunch of puckering and, you know, distortions and warping if you anchor your beads carefully that way. Um, it's a nice way to do it. The other piece was um, really beautiful bag at the um, British Museum, I believe, um, Pitt River Museum, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, it's been a while now. Um, one of the curators there reached out to me uh, because she's curious about the weave. She wanted to know if the bag could have been woven all at once or if the two darker sections on the edges had to be woven separately and then kind of loop stitched on. And I said, I do that weaving, it's oblique weaving and you can do multiple um, colors at once. They interlock as you weave, but they stay distinct zones unless you decide to bring in and cross threads and then you know cross colors and things like that. Um, this is buffalo wool, it's undyed. So buffalo wool comes in a few different shades. You know, the younger ones might have slightly lighter colored wool. Um, and then there's kind of a middle range and a darker buffalo wool as well. And this of course has glass trade beads that have been woven. Uh, sorry, that's my dogs. I don't know if you guys can hear them, sorry. Um, this one has glass trade beads that are woven into the fabric. Um, oftentimes nowadays folks will stitch on beads when folks were more so spinning a lot of their own yarns. You could spin it to whatever you, weight you wanted or needed. So if you had beads of a certain diameter, you could spin your yarn so it would be easy or relatively easy to push those beads up and fit them into the weaving as you went versus having to wait and then stitch them onto the surface afterwards where they don't sit quite the same way. And it had an interesting wavy line pattern on one side and then these figures holding things between them. It's an interesting bag. I wonder if they're holding wampum between them for ceremony, you know, for some kind of gathering a long time ago. Um, and so, you know, we, we talked about the bag and uh, I'm not sure that they ever typed up the report um, but we had an interesting time discussing the possibilities for this particular bag. Um, I think it was collected in Indiana and it had some modifications by a non-native owner later. So there was a button added to the, in there was cloth lining it, a button added to the inside that was wrapped with linen. Um, and so you could see how someone had acquired it, however they acquired it, and then modified it for their, their own use later. Um, I do a lot of weaving. There's oblique weaving. The, the red and black sash on the upper right here is um, an example of oblique. So it's the same technique as that buffalo wool, but I was using a modern commercial fine worsted wool for this particular one. It's very fine. It's very fabric-like, um, you know, because it's a 50-50 weave. So you can see that, you know, it looks like conventional cloth in many ways. Um, really tightly woven, but really nice surface. And then um, this one is based off a Nantucket sash from the 18th century that is in the Peabody Harvard collection. It's, it's you know, it's well-worn and faded and there's some moth damage, but, you know, again, the, the vertical stripes interlocking. Um, so you can see the multiple designs, multiple colors um, consecutively be, can be woven together. It's very strong. Um, this is a gentleman at Cambridge ART doing a, production of um, Moby Dick, um, who had gotten one of my finger woven sashes because he wanted some wampum and some textiles as well to add some authenticity, I think, to his outfit on stage. And then the other image is 
some old stone tools from various places in, I think, the um, Harvard, Massachusetts area that were collected by residents there. And um, the weaving that I made is to display and cushion the stonework because they were belongings. And I think oftentimes when folks just find arrowheads out of context in the ground from gardening, been handed down in their families, don't really know how they were made, what they're used for, don't know who made them, didn't talk to anybody uh, to get them, just found them. Um, there's so little context that it's really hard, uh, you know, to, to put them out and ask the general public that's visiting a museum to get anything much from an exhibit of a bunch of arrowheads. I think it's not fair. Um, and so I think with doing it this way, I want to underline, you know, the difference between finding something and dealing with somebody directly and trading an object for an object, sharing knowledge back and forth from our respective cultures. There's agency in that. There isn't necessarily agency when you come along and find someone's stuff um, in the ground and just take it. Uh, so, you know, being aware of that and being sensitive to that um, and then dealing with the modern day descendants of those communities and, and saying, okay, what's, what's respectful? How you know, could we display this in a way that is a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more respectful of those that we didn't ask, <laughs> but we have their things. Um, and so I was trying to kind of underline the concept of, of agency and um, ethical display, I think. I do a lot of workshops <laughs> and um, I love working with color. I love working with natural dyes. Um, I became really dedicated to natural dyes when I was using a lot of commercial yarn and I was actually having some allergic reactions to a long-term exposure of those commercial yarns with the chemicals and the chemicals and the dyes and started researching how caustic they are and um, how they, you know, when there's leaks and those chemicals go into rivers, they kill all the fish, you know. Um, it's not a good thing. When you're an artist and you hope to literally spend your life working with these materials, you realize, you know, that it's gonna come with costs. And so I started to think about how, you know, all of our dyes used to be local and natural and, you know, for the most part, non-toxic. I mean, there's a few that I wouldn't be drinking for sure, but, but um, there's, you know, careful handling of those um, renders it fine because once it's adhered to the yarn, it's not gonna go anywhere necessarily. Um, and you use it up so you're not doing anything to the environment. Um, so I started working with natural dyes and mordanting them to make them permanent. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I've had a lot of fun. I worked with basket weavers in the Northwest coast doing a natural dye workshop. So we spent a couple of days just making all these beautiful colors and then folks who wanted to stay afterwards because we were still having fun. We would just add dyes to each other to see what colors we could make after that. Um, it was pretty, uh, pretty nice. We had a good time. Um, and then there's a picture of some yellow yarn we made with Osage orange, which actually just gives you yellow dyes or green dyes, depending on how you treat them. And then there's a blueberry dye in the back with some corn husk in it that's giving that nice kind of purple blue. And then there's some matter root and I'm not sure if I used Osage orange or gold thread or sunflower petals. It's another great, great one for the yellow for the corn husk. The black walnut's great on, on corn husk as well. Um, and then, of course, once you've prepared your material, you do your weaving project or your basketry project, what have you, whatever you're working on, essentially. Um, I've also done, you know, I think at Amherst College, I, we did a natural dye workshop, but we got organic socks and T-shirts. So everybody dyed their, their clothes and then they got to take them home with them at the, the end of the project. So we had a lot of fun. It was nice. Um, and then, you know, worked on other projects, collaborated with my community to design um, an educational kiosk that was going to be a little bit easier to maintain than a traditional lead to, you know, it's hard finding the, the old trees. Um, you don't just go and cut a bunch of old trees for no reason. So if someone's cutting trees already um, and you can get the bark, great. And if it's in good, good enough condition um, and in big enough sheets, great for building a lead to but then you've got to worry about replacing them when they get damaged eventually over the years by the elements. Um, we wanted something modern. We were able to find these um, basically shingles uh, made from bark um, and make a modern version. We decided to put a design in the floor. So I came up with a four directional um, turtle island symbol, you know, basically a 
a native concept of North America is that turtle island, that turtle shape and how it's emerging out of the ocean. So there's a lot of, um, you know, traditional beliefs around that and wants to underline that um, as being native space. So we put the turtle in the center of the floor and then we took various materials that the community made, myself included. There was a net my brother made. There was a cedar bark mat that I made. Um, we had maps um, and stories and things like that. So visitors could come and learn about our community um, because I think otherwise folks were just like ducking into the gift shops or the restaurant and asking where the Indians were or whatever. Um, and it wasn't necessarily terribly organized and it's a little odd. Um, and so we were trying to direct that a little bit <laughs> and give people authentic information. Um, you know, that they could digest and appreciate. So, so I think that's kind of the extent of my talk. I didn't have a lot of historic material in my presentation because I didn't want to go over the same ground, but there's a great diversity in Northeastern art. So you can obviously look at museum collections for other examples of quill work and weaving, basketry and things like that in this area and beyond, you know, nowadays too. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all that information, Elizabeth. Uh, so we are going to open um, uh, questions. We're gonna open for questions and um, you can unmute yourself um, and you can just either um, just raise your hand or you can use the uh, icon to raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, so I know I have a question for you, Elizabeth. Um, for example, so one of the, um, woven belts that you um, did. How how long, you, you know, I know each project is going to um, take you, um, yeah. you know, a, a variety of time, but um, how much would some of these belts? Yeah, so days, um, not and not just a couple typically either. So with weaving a belt, I, you know, I have to cut all my yarns. Um, sometimes I'm dyeing those yarns myself. Sometimes I'm using commercially dyed yarns, depending on the project and, you know, what I feel like and what I have time for. Um, and so you kind of, you have to come up with what design you want to do, whether it's chevron or lightning, or you want to do, if you want to create your own variation, that might add a little time. Um, this is a complex lightning design um, in black and kind of an off-white, white and gold. Um, and it's a bandolier sash, so worn crossbody. It's long, you know, it's for a man. Um, some of my sashes might be six or seven feet long. Sometimes they're even longer. Um, and sometimes they're, you know, modest three inches, four inches. Sometimes they're wider, like six or seven, eight inches as well. Um, there's a bunch of different weaves. And sometimes I also incorporate Incorporate, excuse me, things like buffalo wool that I'm spinning myself. Um, and sometimes I use other materials as well uh, for texture and, you know, to have a traditional flair. Um, so, you know, it takes hours just to cut all of your warps. You know, if you have like 16 per color or 20 per color, you know, however many across um, to create all of those jags and the lightning design, then you have your, your stick. You set it up in sequence, however you want your pattern to go. And then, you know, lightning design, you're weaving left to right, but it's like relay weaving. Um, chevron, you're weaving from the center out. Oblique weaving, you're weaving from the center out, essentially, but you're also keeping a hand on it to keep it quite tight. It's got a bit of a different texture from finger weaving. The other types are kind of compressed this way. And so your, your weft elements are hidden. Oblique weaving, you see, the weft throughout and it's really tight. You don't see, you know, light daylight through it, um, but it's it's flat. It's kind of spread out, but tight. Um, so it, it's sort of like thinner and wider um, in some ways when you get done with a piece, if that makes sense. Um, you're asking about time and I'm not mm. for timing myself. Mm -hmm. um, Without distractions, if I have like nine to five days that I can work on sashes, you know, it would probably take me a week or two, depending on the sash. Um, I also typically, this one is edged with leather um, because the person didn't want fringe. Oftentimes if there's fringe, then I'll do a complex braid, like a five strand or six strand braid to make it look really nice. And also it keeps, your, keeps the fringe from getting knotted up. Um, as well. 
Um, so you can figure at least 40 hours, um, really, I think probably closer to 50 or 60 is typical, maybe more on a longer sash and with the fringe as well. Um, and then there's folks who also want me to embellish it with beadwork. And then if I do the oblique weave with the beadwork woven in, then that's going to add time because you've got to get your beads on and then you've got to pay attention to where you are and position those to create, you know, usually zigzag, Vs, fish designs, waves. Um, sometimes human figures like these. I haven't done human figures because it's just, it's usually not something that I go for, even in my wampum. Um, I tend to do a lot more angular or curvilinear design work. Um, twining of, is done for sashes too. So I didn't mention it, but this red sash that you're looking at here in the Peabody Harvard collection is basically trade cloth and trade glass beads being used for our traditional patterning. So that loss, that wave curvilinear design shape, you'll see it on traditional, um, ba uh, not basketry so much, some, some twined basketry, but more so twined matting. Um, you'll see those curvilinear designs um, when you're making twined, vertically twined sashes, those curvilinear designs become possible. I did quite a bit of that. Um, even recently I went, you know, on an artist residency and I got some really nice linen yarn and, um, and created a, a basic, it looks like this in a lot of ways, except the color pattern is, is uh, the color balance is different. Um, so yeah, the materials and technique kind of control the appearance. You wouldn't necessarily use the oblique weave to create a lozenge design. It would be more angular and different. You can definitely create interesting designs, but they're just not gonna have that rounded appearance that the twine weaving, floating the twine weaving left is gonna allow you to do, so. Yeah, I mean, I, it's your, your creativity and your materials, how complicated the finished piece um, needs to look, that all kind of controls it. Excellent, thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Peggy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Anything. Is it in the chat? Did you, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So um, I do a lot of needle felting and I just wondered whether that had appeared, whether influenced by English or, or had, uh, it was a tradition of that predating um, mm -hmm. Europeans. Hmm. Okay. So there's a technique called false embroidery that is Northeastern native um, that has to do with tight weaving where you're, it's like, um, you know, it might be a softer material like a milkweed or an Indian hemp. And then you're taking deer hair um, that are long or porcupine quills that can be, you know, not huge, but, you know, material that is softened in water. You can dye it or you can use the natural color and dye some as well. And so you're over wrapping the front surface of the weaving to create a pattern on the front surface of the weaving only. And then you just tuck in your ends and trim them all on the inside of the, the material, the basket or what have you, tump line, uh, choker, belt, whatever you can, there's a lot of different applications. It's a bit different from needlework uh, because you don't really need a needle. What I have seen modern artists do, because of course, porcupines take a lot of extra preparation. You've got to clean them. They're from a wild animal. They don't smell awesome when you harvest them, let's just say. Um, and they won't take a dye until you get some of the dirt and grease off. You know? um, and so you, know, you clean them, dye them, sort them by color, by, by size, excuse me. So like the width varies quite a bit. They can be super fine like hair or quite a bit wider. Um, and so if you don't wanna do all of that or you can't do all of that, let's say you don't have access to materials, you might go and buy modern embroidery thread and use it that way. So in that case, you might, yeah, sure. I can see using a heavier tapestry needle for that. Um, you don't have to, but you might want to, you know, cause it just makes it more manageable, you know, keep it from getting tangled up or 
you know, getting mixed up with anything as you're doing your weaving. So those are, you know, the way I've seen false embroidery done is during the weaving process. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that you go back and try, because I think it would be tough not to get the barb or the quill stuck on other weaving, to get it to go where you need it to go. Um, I think it just needs to be done as you go along, I think is the best way. That adds a layer of complexity and a lot of time. Those are very special pieces. Woven quill work is really fine and builds up really slow. So those are really special pieces. You know, I might spend two hours a day before my eyes get tired on woven quill work for quite a while before I finish my pieces. Um, and that's negating the time to dye it and negating the time to trim it. So it back on a back of leather. So I think our, yeah, the false embroidery, um, like a false embroidery with deer hair or stitching down of deer hair in different patterns would, it's really, it's like an applique um, of a material with thread to a surface like leather, deer skin, buffalo skin, elk skin, whatever. Um, applique of porcupine quills. The effect is that it would remind you, I think, of embroidery or needlework, um, but it is a different discipline. What, what materials were used for warmth in, in blanketing in New England? Sure. Um, and so it, sometimes it depends when you're doing your weaving also. Um, sometimes it depends on, on your blend of materials, right? So plant fibers aren't famous for their warmth, just like our cotton jeans that we buy nowadays. They're, you know, there's that saying for people who are outdoors people, cotton kills. Um, because if you're out hiking someplace where there's a lot of rain and you get soaking wet, cotton does not hold any warmth. And so you can suffer from hypothermia and you can die. Um, and so animal fibers, you know, proteinaceous fibers, uh, they hold, they tend to hold warmth. You know, wool holds warmth even if it's wet. So it's, it's not as risky to wear in those kinds of conditions. We didn't have central heating, of course, back in our houses back then. Um, there was spinning of yarns with sometimes with plant fiber mixed in as well, but with like rabbit fur and turkey feathers all together, takes a dye beautifully. It's wonderfully soft. Um, do not survive in museum collections are described in, you know, by early explorers and traders and, you know, colonists and stuff. Um, they talk about feather capes. Um, so it's like a, a woven base with the, the feathers layered, woven in layered, um, sometimes dyed. Um, sometimes etched with other things. It's really fine weaving, but then it's, it's creating those layers that are insulating, you know, uh, that you're putting on over your other garments of deer skin. Underneath the clothing, you might have an under undergarments, usually of a, a finer woven plant fiber. Um, there were socks, you know, made from materials like animal uh, hairs. Um, so, you know, like deer fur, caribou fur, um, Buffalo wool is really soft and quite warm. Um, so you, you know, you have things you're wearing inside your moccasins, you have different white moccasins and you stuff them with grass as well. So there's insulation. Blanketing and fur mantles, I think were a big thing. So like um, a beautiful, just one deer, you know, for, I'm not big. <laughs> so one deer mantle uh, would keep me warm. I've done, you know, um, a bit of reenacting and experimentation and along those lines. And, um, you know, a beautiful hide that's in new and good shape, tanned with the fur on, you know, you create some nice ties and just wrap it. If you put it fur side in, it's the warmest. Um, and then you can decorate the hide that shows. If it's not particularly cold, you can have the, the hide side in and then the fur is outside. And of course it's very pretty. And that's where, that's where most people like to wear the fur is outside. Um, but, you know, if you really truly want to be warm when it gets really cold and it used to get a lot colder here in Massachusetts, you want that fur side in, then you can layer on top of that. Um, and so, you know, people were physically fit and so you could manage, you know, the weight. Um, uh, you know, garments were flexible. So the capes worn over the shoulders were really common. There were ties, as I said, you could make buttons and things like that out of antler with loops. Um, you might have a one-shouldered garment um, that's, that's kind of a cape, but, you know, one of your arms is free because you're doing something and you don't want fur near the fire or something like that if you're cooking, um, but you're staying active and you're using things like bear grease to seal your skin um, or other types of, of grease that you put some herbs in 
um, to basically, you know, nowadays if I go out in the winter and I have my hands to freeze, I put some hand cream on. Same, same technology, same concept. You're just, you're, you're sealing your pores, you know, so your skin doesn't lose, lose as much warmth um, and get damaged, you know, by windburn, you know, you wouldn't want your face damaged by windburn either. So you might use some cream back then um, that you're making out of natural materials. And, you know, you can just buy that stuff nowadays um, if you, if you need it as well. So same kind of stuff. Um, hoods were worn. Um, you know, I think everybody associates the caps with Mi'kmaq folks exclusively. Um, but I, you know, a lot of Eastern folk wore those. Uh, you can even see um, accounts of folks in Virginia wearing that same type of cap. Um, what you might not have, if it's not terribly cold, you might not have a high peak because you don't have the same, you know, liners in it needing the same amount of insulation. If you're not dealing with extreme cold, there's really, you just don't have the same need for the size and the volume. Um, but it's a really practical way to stay warm. And yeah, people wore stuff on their heads because nobody wants to go outside and freeze <laughs> in, uh, in New England and we get rain and snow and stuff. So, you know, you wouldn't just skip headgear um, and we use snowshoes and all that stuff too. Um, inside your house, fur blankets, you know, so you can sew furs together. So you could sew rabbit furs together, beaver skins, um, moose can be used. It's heavy with the hide, with the, uh, the fur on, it's like a rug, but it's really warm, you know, so you can lay on it and it's, it's quite nice. It's just, it's big and heavy. You know, you trim it down to whatever size and make your bed rolls and things. Um, and then, you know, the feather mantle, same deal. You could mix that, that rabbit fur with the feathers and, and have some really nice woven blankets out of that for your house as well. So yeah, there was quite a, a nice variety. Inside a house, frankly, also, instead of just piling endless blankets on, people had fires, you know, and uh, you have hot coals and they'll continue to emit heat. You have a relatively you know, efficient house so that heat will continue to circulate throughout the house and keep you warm, not just at the ceiling height, you know, which happens in our, our house, terrible now, because um, they warm up where we, we don't sit, uh, they're warmest. But um, the rounded house keep that heat circulating in a way that keeps you pretty comfortable. Um, I've been in We Too's, even when I was a kid, I was surprised um, staying in a friend's We Too. We just covered it with canvas, you know, because we too young to to go and get that bark, it weighs a ton. It's, it's right like at the upper limit of my strength is me handling those sheets of bark um, on a good day. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of labor. Um, my ancestors were in really good shape. So we had a heavy canvas that we were covering this smaller round we two in the woods here in Dartmouth. And um, yeah, I, I had to take my winter coat off. It was the coldest day of the year, some February way back, way back when we actually got cold winters here in Massachusetts. And um, yeah, it was, it was really efficient. We, you know, warmed some stew over the fire. We had a really nice time, but it really gave me an appreciation for how pleasant um, traditional housing is. It, it really wasn't, everybody thinks it was just straight roughing it every day with a hardship. Kind of nice. I like them. I would totally have one. If I didn't think that I would be risking maybe having vandals do something to it or weird neighbors copying an attitude, I'd probably have one right now. So, yeah. Hi, I was wondering what do you use for mordants? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, we use metals traditionally. So in New England soils, you, there's a lot of iron. It's, um, it's kind of ugly looking. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure that it's the, the kind that folks love for industry, but there, it's just common, you know, bog iron all over the place. Um, and so you can dissolve that if you want to make uh, vinegar from scratch. If you're a purist, you take maple sugar, maple syrup rather, um, put it in a container, maybe add some branch twigs, you know, from the area branches, maybe some maple branches, um, and maybe some leaves, let it just rot um, and turn into a vinegar. Um, and then use that to dissolve that iron for a nice mordant. Um, you can also use tannic acid. And so here there's a lot of oak, so oak bark, oak leaves, right. they actually dye the water kind of a brown rust color. That's, that's your tannic, that's tannic acid, basically tannins in the water. Um, uh, 
yeah, there's just a lot of that. And a lot of that was used later on in commercial tanneries in this region. You know, I can just think of places just a few miles from where I live that used to be trading posts. There's still like general stores and stuff now that native families even had where they were tanning hides and selling them. Oak tan um, hide, yeah. Yeah, oak, oak is tannic, tannic acid yeah. is awesome. Um, oak galls, another, you know, source, obviously same, same yeah. tree. Um, so okay. tannic acid is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anyone else? I can't tell. I have, I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Uh, hold on. Here, Go I'll ahead. Hold on for it. Um, hi. Um, I was just wondering, there was a photo that you showed us in your slideshow earlier that was like a, a leather bag, I think. Um, and I wasn't sure if it was a example of no, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that one. So is that an, an example of the, what you were talking about, the false weaving, or is that like the dye is actually poked into the leather? Yeah, it's, um, it's a paint. So like you would take a pigment, you know, nowadays I'm buying paint, but if you want to grind up red ochre, you can get a shade, a range of shades from red ochre and um, I think if you temperature treat it, you can change, influence the, the shade of red that you get as well. So that's a dry pigment when you grind it up real fine. And then you need your base. Um, egg whites are sort of a worldwide paint base. You know, when you need to paint, um, you mix that up and then you apply that. Um, and so typically we would be painting this on not so much with hair paint brushes because you wanna add pressure, you wanna get it into that textured deer skin surface and you want good coverage. So you're more so carving um, tools out of bone, tools out of antler, tools out of um, wood. I've made all, you know, all of those materials make really nice. And you can even do like a multi-prong thing. So if you need to do multiple lines and you have a tool that you can just dip and make mm -hmm. those lines parallel, you do things to save time. You might save bird quills and cut them to make some circles. Um, you might make yourself a template out of birch bark you know, if you want a perfect curve, double curve or circle or something else, and you're going to repeat it, you know, why go through the work of eyeing it, trying to eyeball it and make it perfect. You could just, you know, have a trace, quickly trace, fill it in um, and save yourself time too. So there's so many um, different aspects of doing a really nice job painting, I think. Um, it's a really, it's really its own discipline. And then the, the inspiration for the designs, of course, come out of our, you know, native taste in the Northeast, appreciation for really fine pattern work, um, netted designs, obviously we're fishing people, not a surprise that we use netted designs in our, you know, painting and to fill in the background. Vines, you can't go anywhere in New England where there aren't vines, you know, uh, whether it's grapevines or you know poison ivy or what have you there's a million there's a lot of different plants there's water designs there's fish there's whales there's birds um yeah i mean uh, probably the best preserved hide painted examples um are the caribou coats from further north that have been preserved i think i have seen a few examples of um deer skin objects that are painted as well um but i think you know in this region native people wore them use them uh i'm not sure about puritans being so keen on highly decorated clothing so i, I just i have a hard time believing that folks that have gone out of their way to preserve examples of those early on i know they didn't they didn't like it when we continued to wear them um because they complained about you know the missionaries that were here like john elliott and all complained when uh folks came out kind of dressed up with traditional attire back then. Cool, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, Anne. Yeah, hi, Elizabeth, this is Anne Schoenier. We have met at cultural survival events. Ah, oh, nice, okay, yeah. And, I and yeah, it's been really interesting hearing you tonight. Thank you for doing this. I was wondering about the natural dyes and mm -hmm. is there a difference? Um, in the dyes you'd use for animal um, products like particularly porcupine and something you'd use for plant fibers? Um, no, I mean, sometimes maybe 
you know, porcupine quills don't always require a ton of mordants, which is quite nice. Um, and so it's sometimes it's an extra step you don't have to go through because they're proteinaceous and they take the dyes quite ready and readily and quite permanently. Um, and then when they don't, you can totally tell because you start weaving with them and you rub the, the color off so you realize, oh yeah, that didn't work. And so then you go back and use some tannic acid. The mordants tend to be pretty consistent um, across the board. Tannic acid, alum, you know, is a river alum would be traditional, but you can buy commercial alum now. Um, iron, copper. Um, I don't really, I can't really say I use tin and chrome. I don't use things that I, where I would worry maybe about exposure to toxins or if, you know, worry if I dumped out dye I didn't use. I don't want to be dumping something that I'm, you know, just not sure about putting in the environment, to be honest, or dumping down my sink. Um, so I'm pretty careful. I try to use natural oak galls and things like that as much as possible, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think with splint basketry is more so kind of its own thing. Um, so you might be needing to use some salt. You might be needing to use some, I think, steel wool, I think with black walnut. Um, yeah, there's different different ways to make a permanent application on wood. Um, it's It just behaves, the molecules are different um, and its reactivity is different to dyes. And so you really do have to experiment a little bit to make sure something's strong enough that it's gonna be permanent because you don't wanna weave a basket, have nice color and your poor customer comes back weeks later with some faded, sad looking, you know, <laughs> object or something like that. Um, you know, I think part of natural dye work is you make the stuff, you dye your materials, and then I'll deliberately leave things out, you know, just to see, is that color gonna shift on me? Um, I use some natural blueberry and some tannic acid. And I, um, I think the, the reddish aspect of that dye, so it looked a little bit more purple. The reds went away. They were actually, you know, um, I forget what you call it when something disappears and oxidizes, but it, the blue gray was permanent um, and it stayed, you know, on, on that yarn. So I just thought it was really interesting that at first I thought I had kind of a purpley looking dye, but really it was more of a soft kind of natural looking blue gray. Um, same on quills, you can get that same color on porcupine quills. Up in Maine, folks use blueberries. It's such a big blueberry industry. It makes total sense um, on porcupine quills quite a bit. Uh, it's pretty color. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Amy Nicole. I, um, my name is Ami and I'm actually um, a member of the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, but I wanted to thank you because I live in diaspora. And so it is often very hard for me to um, get, you know, traditional native knowledge. And so uh, Katapatish, thank you so much for uh, being available to do this first and foremost. Um, second, I wanted to ask, um, since it seems like you have a lot of, uh, connection to local museums and things like that. Is there a particular museum in Massachusetts or you know, in Connecticut or Rhode Island that you really think has a fabulous collection of um, Wampanoag handcrafts? I've been to the Wampanoag Museum out in Mashpee, but of course it's tiny and it's only open like three days a week. <laughs> yeah, All right. So I'd love to be able to, um, you know, expose more people, take people with me, um, and it's just hard to do with the Mashpee Museum. So, if there are other recommendations, I would love to hear. Sure. Um, so, a lot of what I had to do was travel an awful lot, read pretty much everything I could find, and yep, even <laughs> some of the nicest Eastern stuff is in Europe. Okay. Um, you know, kind of essentially spoils of war. Um, yes. and, and things like that. Um, beautiful wampum there, beautiful early quill work, uh, really nice, awesome kind of boot moccasins with, with false embroidery quill work. But, you know, that said, there are Eastern pieces in museums, both non-native as well as native museums here. Not, don't expect that every early piece that's Eastern is gonna be labeled accurately as to which tribe because they weren't being collected by people who were particularly interested in uh, particulars or the maker's name, unfortunately, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can see a regional style. Sometimes you can discern a tribal style. Um, 
Peabody Harvard Museum has some Eastern stuff. Uh, Peabody Essex Museum has some Eastern materials, wampum, a little bit of wampum. I don't know that they have a lot, but I, I'm not sure. Um, but I've seen false embroidery there. Um, some museums have nice Eastern moccasin collections with, with, you know, learning quill work, I had to look at collections. I looked at books. If a friend of mine had gone to Michigan and came back with a nice quilled bag, I would say, hang on, can you freeze? I need to stare at these quill work stitches and go home and practice these. Um, and it was, you know, I hate to give my age away, but it was like before we had cell phones where you could just take pictures all over the place super easy and like send it to yourself or whatever, or get your friend to send you pictures. It just wasn't, the technology was not there, trust me. Um, yeah, I wish there was one central location, you know, one awesome tribal museum. The Pequot Museum does have um, some nice uh, Eastern material. Um, I wish there was one stop yeah, shop. I've been right? down to DC and they have almost nothing. Yeah. That's right. Um, on display. I mean, they have stuff in their storehouses, but you can't, it, especially post COVID, you can't get permission to go in anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I went, I, this, the Maryland collection there, the, the behind the scenes. Sure. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, really I, have sorry a, I have a friend who actually works for the, the Maryland collection. We yeah. just recently to DC, we were there in January. Oh, and okay. She, yeah, it's really hard to be able to get in these days. We haven't reopened things after COVID. Oh. Uh, so they don't have a lot of visitors now. Oh. Um, I did have one more question for you. Um, and that's, I, I'd love to be able to take other classes with you or go to other workshops. And so do you have anything else that's coming up? Or is there anything else that you do remotely like this or are you coming? out of the Cape anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I'm always looking to see if stuff is happening not two hours away from me. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do classes sometimes. I haven't lately because things have gone back to in person. So I have been doing a lot less Zoom. Uh, during the pandemic, folks were great for reaching out, you know, corn husk weaving or um, natural dye workshop. I did a natural dye demo when I was at 20 summers that we filmed. Um, could still be on their website. I was using Brazil wood, you know, to dye silk scarves and that was fun. Um, that was just me because it was like people were just getting vaccinated then, you know, so it was just me in the kitchen getting filmed there um, with no, you know, students. Uh, yeah, the short answer is probably right now I'm kind of redoing my website and getting ready for a couple of art exhibits. One will be at the Tufts Museum in the fall and the other will be at the Mead Museum, which is you know, in Amherst College um, in the fall. And so I've been doing a little bit less by way of teaching, but you know, there's a possibility, probably if I did some remote teaching, it would be maybe through my, the Equinocultural Center, we'll do things online sometimes. Yeah, I'm taking um, the Makasanash class yeah, with okay. uh, Nadeja and um, uh, uh, Tyson A right now. <laughs> Excellent, yeah, so uh, no, keep, keep an eye on their website. I used to do things in person there. I, you know, I did the, the eel trap weaving and I've done, you know, other demonstrations there as well. Um, yeah, things have changed a little bit. Yeah. It's, it's interesting trying to navigate it now. But, yeah, oh. I mean, I love that there are resources now that allow me to be able to take classes remotely. Um, but, you know, and I have, I've, I've driven down to take language classes because I oh, can't nice. see that remotely, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard when, you know, when I'm trying to go to class and driving down, you know, it's a four hour drive to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Come> no. <back. laughs> I've got a 14 year old who comes with me, so we don't spend the night or anything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, that's but yeah, so I'm always looking for, for resources, um, outside of, of the Cape. Thank you again, Katapatush, for, for being available and for doing this. It's really wonderful to be able to connect with the work that you're doing. Thank you. I was going to say too, if you sign up on my, I'm going to get my new website on Shopify up. If you sign up there, I'll have your email contact. So when I do a blast notification of, oh, I'm going to do this or be there, um, you'll, you know, I'll have your contact info. There's my, my, my Gmail and then my shop site that's going to go up, probably be live later this week or early next week. If that helps. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ami. Um, and speaking of which, um, we actually have Elizabeth's presentation from January um, is live on our YouTube channel. Um, and so I just posted that into the chat. 
In addition, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, Pinewoods Camp, or maybe it's Pinewoods Dance Camp, um, you can see uh, her brother and sister-in-law that did a series last winter. Um, so um, all of it was fabulous. So thank you again um, um, for being here tonight and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and again, this presentation will probably be up um, hopefully in about a week or so. Um, and then I just wanna do another shout out to the Mass Cultural Council and uh, Situate and Plymouth Local Cultural Councils for um, supporting this program. Uh, so thank you. Anything else that you wanna say, Elizabeth? Um, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, just one more thing about Native arts, oftentimes going to Native events, I'm sure you know, um, going to Mashpee Powwow, going to the Aquina Powwow, um, going to some of our socials, you can meet the artists, you might be able to see them wearing some of their traditional stuff and ask questions, or see someone demonstrating an arts as well. So in community, that's one way. Um, and sometimes, and I used to set up it at our um, artisan fair in July, I'd get bored, so I'd do my full work right there. And yeah, because I don't like just sitting at a table. Few artists like really sitting at a table, so we're usually busy on something or other that's good. So, you know, sometimes meet, getting out and meeting folks is really nice, when you can, um, you is, is a nice way. You want me to? Uh -huh. yeah. All right. So, oh, I think- I just, I'd just like oh. to thank you for inviting us and it was very informative and we really enjoyed it. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, yeah. Chris, and thanks, Kathy. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice night, everybody. You too. All right. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.